welcome to the history of comic books, which also could be called the, uh, the study of history and comic books. And I will explain that distinction in a moment. My name is Troy Smith. I will be your professor. Um, my, uh, my PhD is in the history of race and ethnicity in the United States. And I uh, am currently putting the finishing touches, uh, finishing revisions on a manuscript about race and comic books. And I have, uh, I've taught this course several times and done a lot of research in the area. But beyond that, I'm also a comic book fan and I have been since before I learned to read. So uh, going on 50 years now. Now, some of you probably also are longtime fans of the genre, or perhaps uh, you have recently been introduced to the genre or to graphic novels and you'd like to learn more, or maybe you don't know hardly anything about the, uh, about the subject and would like to learn. So no matter which approach you're taking, and no matter which direction you're coming from, I hope that this is a very enlightening experience for you and a fun one, as it always is for me. Now, just to um, kind of let you know what we're going to be, uh, what we're going to be doing, and what it meant when I said there's a distinction between the history of comic books and history and comic books. We're going to be looking at both. This class is going to be an examination of the history of the medium. Um, and it's going to focus much more so on comic books, periodicals, than on comic strips and, and graphic novels, though we will get into those things as well. But what we're also going to be doing is we're going to be, as we trace this medium over time, we're going to be looking at the ways in which the history of, of the world around us interacted with that medium. We're going to be looking at how what was going on in the world at particular times, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, Vietnam, uh, and, and so on, how that affected how things were portrayed in comic books, and and sometimes even how uh, what was being portrayed in comic books kind of bled over into the the larger world. Particularly, I'm thinking of the 1950s when there were congressional hearings about uh, censorship of comic books. So. Maybe you're familiar with all that stuff already, maybe you're not, but hopefully we will be delving pretty deeply into some things that, um, that, that you're not already an expert on. And by the time we get through, uh, you will be, or at least you'll be well on your way. All right, well, let's get started. When we say comics, there's a lot of different things we could be talking about. I mean, you know, we could be talking about comedians, but that's a totally uh, different thing. But uh, we could be talking about comic strips, for instance, like Garfield there on, uh, on top. Those short sequences of just a few panels, sometimes just a couple of panels, that uh, appear in the comic section of newspapers. Perhaps you've heard of those antique things. Or we could be talking about graphic novels. And there, the uh, image on the lower left are several graphic novels, including uh, Kindred, uh, which is uh, one of the ones that, that, that we uh, read in this class, uh, and Mouse. And uh, a couple of, uh, well, Kindred is pretty new. There's a couple of other pretty new ones here, the best we could do. Um, or we could be talking about what we see in the lower right, which are comic books uh, that are essentially uh, magazines, magazine-length stories uh, full of the same kind of uh, sequential art 
storytelling. And in fact, that, that's mainly what this class deals with, is the history of comic books, which do still exist uh, more and more often when, uh, when I ask students about their experience with comic books or even graphic novels. Uh, students don't have that much uh, experience oftentimes. A lot, of, uh, a lot of times they recognize the characters or the titles from movies or TV shows adapted from the, uh, the original books or sometimes from, from video games. But they're still out, although they're more and more going toward uh, digital delivery. Um, however, in, in, the course of, uh, in the course of this class, we're going to be talking about comic strips some near the beginning of the course because that leads into the comic books and we'll be talking about graphic novels quite a bit toward the end of the course because in a lot of ways comic books then lead into uh, into them for these first few minutes we're going to be talking about some concepts that that first appeared in a couple of very important books about comic books uh, and about comic art. The first one came out in 1985 by Will Eisner. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about Will Eisner in here. Hopefully you've already heard of him. Um, if you haven't, well, he's the uh, creator of the, uh, the comic, uh, comic strip, the, the Spirit, and uh, generally considered one of the most important figures, particularly in the early years of, of comic books, also very important in the development of graphic novels, which are, as I said, kind of a different thing. The, uh, the awards that are given out nowadays for, uh, for achievement in comic books, kind of like, you know, the, uh, um, the Academy of Motion Pictures give out the Oscars. Uh, well, the awards that go to, to comic book uh, professionals are the Eisner Awards, which shows how important he was. So he came out with this book in 1985 called Comics and Sequential Art. He was the one that sort of uh, coined that expression, sequential art, as a way to define what comics are, which is to say they, uh, um, they are artwork that has multiple pictures and that you have to look at them in order in order to uh, get a, a story. Now, words are also part of it, but words don't necessarily have to be part of it. For it to be comics, though, you have to have the art. Okay, the uh, second book came out in 1993, and it's called Understanding Comics, The Invisible Art by Scott McCloud. And this is a very readable book because not only is it a book about comic books, it's actually a comic book about comic books. The whole thing is written in comics form, but it goes into a lot of detail about the history of the, uh, of the form and a lot of the, the different technical aspects of it. Sequential art has been around for a very long time, thousands of years. Perhaps, uh, perhaps as far back as early cave paintings that uh, were uh, sometimes a series of paintings next to one another that could perhaps tell a story. We, uh, we don't always necessarily know. But for sure, by the time of ancient Egypt, there were, uh, uh, there, there were examples of sequential art that told a story as you followed along. Now, I want to point out that this is Egyptian art, and that is different from hieroglyphs or pictographs, which you're no doubt familiar with from, from Egypt. This, well, it's, it's symbols, it's pictures, uh, sometimes of identifiable things, but it's actually writing because each of these symbols is not something that's part of telling a story, but it represents a, a sound or a word. So that's technically writing. But the, uh, the paintings from, from ancient Egypt, on the other hand, do in fact tell a story with each thing representing um, uh, 
not some uh, idea or sound, but uh, actually what it is visually representing. And that goes, uh, that goes across cultures uh, over in the Western Hemisphere in the, uh, in the 1500s when Cortez uh, conquered the Aztec Empire and took lots of stuff from them. One of the things they took was this, uh, this codex, the Mexican codex that tells the story of uh, the cultural hero named Eight Deer Jaguar Claw. So you can see in the bottom right, this is actually a really, really long um, piece of folded up um, deer skin, actually is what it was, what it was made from. And as you continue unfold, I think it's 36 feet long. And then you keep unfolding and you follow the story of this, uh, of this hero. Uh, another example that, uh, that is pretty famous, uh, particularly in um, European uh, history, the, the Bayeux Tapestry, which tells the story. This is kind of a close-up of uh, some of the images on that, that tapestry. So zooming out a little bit. Um, this is like uh, pieces of it all put together. It's a big, long, well, it's a tapestry, right? And it tells the story of the Norman conquest of England in the year 1066. So each set of pictures takes you a little bit further into the story. Another important step in the evolution of sequential art came in the form of what were called Biblia Pauperum in the uh, Middle Ages in medieval Europe. Biblia Pauperum, or Poor People's Bible. Um, perhaps you've heard of illuminated manuscripts, and there's one that just uh, popped up. Those were very elaborate, uh, frequently very beautiful manuscripts in which the manuscript is the focus, and there, uh, there are those elaborate pictures that are sort of in the background or sort of, uh, sort of on the side. But with the Poor People's Bible, the emphasis is on the pictures. Uh, and some of the pictures have uh, little writing or sometimes no writing at all. And then you follow the pictures to get the story. And as you can see there where I have... Uh, uh, the uh, red circle, uh, when characters are speaking in the Biblia Pauperum, their words come out of their mouth as scrolls. And that's, that's very similar to the modern day um, speech balloons in, in comic strips. Well, the, the difference between the illuminated manuscripts and the uh, poor people's Bible is that the Biblia Pauperum were designed so that uh, clergy could teach Bible stories to people who couldn't read at all or could read very little, hence the emphasis on the pictures. In the 1730s, the English painter William Hogarth did two series of paintings and engravings, and each of these two series were uh, composed of several different images that all together told one story. The first one was called A Harlot's Progress, and then the second one, kind of looking at the other side of the coin, A Rake's Progress. And uh, well, the first one had six uh, images, the second one had eight images. So if you view these images side by side, which is how they were intended to be displayed, then uh, essentially you would see how the sinfulness of these characters led them uh, led them down the down the path of uh, iniquity to their destruction. So uh, this was in some ways kind of like uh, you know well it was definitely sequential art, some kind of really highbrow forebears of what would later be called comic strips. Well, that is a very quick, very broad overview of sequential art. Now we're very broadly and quickly going to look at the history of
cartoons until we reach the point where those two things come together. Political cartoons became a thing in the uh, middle 18th century, the mid to late 1700s, certainly by the time of the French Revolution, although there were several instances of sort of prototypes of political cartoons before that. In fact, Hogarth, who uh, made those prints of his uh, engravings in the 1730s, is sometimes referred to as uh, sort of the grandfather of political cartooning because there was a, a very moralistic bent, although there was nothing explicitly political in uh, the things that he did. That was not true with the work of James Gilray, who is often called the father of political cartoons. He was an English artist who started working in the late 1700s. Uh, this is one of his more famous uh, works. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, the plum pudding is in danger. That's the name of the uh, of the picture, and you've got uh, Napoleon and King George carving up the world between them. Basically, that's from 1805. Uh, Gilray had uh, been working for some time before that. Like I said, the the late 1700s. Now, by the uh, by the early 1800s, this had uh, this had spread. To the United States. Oh, and by the way, I, I should have mentioned that political cartoons uh, at this time period that we're talking about were just like uh, Hogarth's works. They were uh, engravings that were uh, run off as, as prints and sold individually. Here's one from 1807 from the United States that is a uh, cartoon satirizing the embargo that Thomas Jefferson enacted against both Britain and France. So uh, George and Napoleon carving up the world between them, the U.S. was trying to remain neutral, and both sides were doing things like boarding American ships. So Jefferson decided to punish them both. Uh, this cartoon has got a snapping turtle, and the, uh, the words of embargo have been switched around, so it's, oh, grab me. Uh, and uh, the guy on the left says, damn it, how he nicks him. And uh, the turtle has uh, grabbed this other guy, um, grabbed this other guy by the, uh, the hind quarters, and he's saying, oh, this cursed, oh, grab me. Uh, this was a criticism of Jefferson's embargo that was mostly hurting not the British and the French, but American merchants. Uh, that's the idea. Uh, another cartoon, very similar, from a couple of years later, shows Thomas Jefferson basically being robbed by two highwaymen, two, uh, two thieves, two brigands, who are, of course, Napoleon and King George III. Uh, I have there a transcription of the word balloons because these things were very, 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 very wordy. Um, that sort of thing wouldn't really fly in a one-panel cartoon uh, today. Well, let's take a look at the, uh, the word cartoon. It comes from an Italian word, cartone, which was used by European artists during the medieval period. Essentially, when someone like Leonardo uh, da Vinci or some of those other medieval painters were preparing to do a painting... They would, uh, they would do a sort of a study first. They would do a smaller version, a miniature version, so they could, that could help them sort of plan out the painting. And they would usually do that on heavy paper, kind of like cardboard, essentially. Um, and so it was, uh, well, kind of uh, a sketch or kind of a rudimentary painting. And uh, the word for this heavy paper that was similar to cardboard was cartone, or carton, uh, and that became eventually in English cartoon. So uh, the, the word cartoon for a long time, all the way up until the mid-19th century, sort of carried with it the, the idea of something really fancy, kind of hoity-toity, the sort of thing that the European masters would use as a template for their, uh, for their masterpieces.
1841, a humor magazine was established in England called Punch, which comes from Punch and Judy, the traditional uh, English puppet show, uh, husband and wife sort of puppet comedy team. Um, and there on the illustration, uh, on the front uh, cover, on the, on the left, you can see the puppet of Punch, Mr. Punch, who is sort of an anarchic uh, character, uh, and there he is interacting with, uh, interacting with the devil. So it's kind of a, uh, uh, a devilish approach because this magazine was mostly satire. And inside the magazine, there were satiric illustrations. And here is the very first one that, uh, that appeared in the magazine, Substance and Shadow. Uh, and essentially, you see all these paintings of the nobility of England, but then the reality of the, the common people, the, the poor people who were sort of uh, in the foreground. Well... You notice uh, above the illustration, it says cartoon number one. They, uh, the, ed the editors, that is, referred to these things as cartoons because they were being sarcastic. Okay, so a cartoon, like I said, was considered a very high-class thing uh, uh, that was sort of a template for a masterpiece. Well, they were not purporting to be creating masterpieces, but they were kind of sarcastically implying that they were, and they used this word cartoon, and that is how the term cartoon began to be applied to these types of uh, single panel illustrations appearing in uh, magazines and newspapers. Here are a couple of other examples of 19th century political cartoons. Uh, the one on the right there is very self-explanatory. This is uh, in reference to what was going on in the lead up to the Civil War in the United States. And then here on the left, you can see the, uh, um, see the gentleman saying, what is your little brother crying about? And the little, little boy, oh, him, he's a regular pessimist, he is. And here are some examples of modern-day newspaper cartoons. The one on the top is a recent uh, political cartoon. And the two on the bottom are examples of cartoons that have run in the comics pages of, of newspapers for, for a long time. Uh, the one on the left is, is Family Circus, ran for decades. Um, the one on the right is The Far Side by Gary Larson. Now, despite the fact that those two and, and others have appeared regularly in the, uh, the funny pages, in the comics section of newspapers, there's, uh, there's some argument as to whether they qualify as comics because they're not sequential. They are single panel. So technically, they're not comics. They're cartoons. All these things sort of came together in the work of Swiss artist Rodolphe Töpfer. And there he is on the right. That is a uh, self-portrait by the artist that was done in 1840. In 1837, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, he published uh, a book called Histoire de Monsieur Vieux-Bois, which was translated into English in 1841, as the adventures of Obadiah Old Buck. And then the following year was serialized, the English translation, serialized in an American newspaper. Well, the, uh, the, the original work, obviously uh, in, in French, was about uh, Monsieur Vieux Bois, or Old Woods, uh, who's essentially, uh, well, it's the romantic misadventures of this... Uh, uh, sort of love-obsessed older guy. And what makes it significant is, again, it's a whole book with uh, each page having several illustrations that taken in sequence tell the story. There is interaction 
throughout between the words and the images. And one of the most significant things about it is the fact that you'll notice there are panel borders. Uh, so six different illustrations on the page separated from one another in, in different panels. For this reason, Terpfer is sometimes uh, called the, the forerunner or the uh, father or grandfather of the, the comic book or the comic strip. Uh, comic strip because uh, not only was this released as a book, but as I mentioned, in the U.S. it was initially serialized um, in sections in newspapers. In 1865, the uh, German artist Wilhelm Busch published a book called Max und Moritz, eine Bubengeschichte in sieben Streichen, or A Boy's History in Seven Strokes, usually translated into English as A Story of Seven Boyish Pranks. So this book, it was a children's book, and it had uh, illustrations, uh, that were accompanied by rhymed couplets, and uh, it focused on two very mischievous little German boys who, spoiler alert, come to a bad end. Um, significant from other children's stories of the time is the fact that there were often multiple illustrations on a single page. Now, these stories became very, very popular very quickly in Germany and throughout the German-speaking world. And about 30 years later, uh, 32 years, 1897, a German immigrant to the United States um, sort of drew inspiration from Max und Moritz for his own pair of mischievous boys, uh, Hans und Fritz, or the Katzenjammer Kids, Rudolf Dirks was his name, and this became one of the first successful and popular comic strips, newspaper comic strips in the United States. Now we're going to step away from sequential art for a little bit, and we're going to turn our attention to literature not um, by any means highfalutin literature, far from it, uh, but rather from uh, what was considered at the time quite vulgar literature that was designed for adolescent boys. Uh, that it was, uh, it was designed to appeal to a sense of adventure, so we're going to look at what's going on there in the 19th and into the early 20th century. And that, also spoiler alert, that is going to merge with sequential art in a very interesting way. 